So the following is just a brief overview that will go through renal transplants focusing on their sonographic evaluation and will hopefully give you a framework from which you can then apply these concepts to real life cases that you'll be seeing during your service. So let's start off by talking about the indications for renal transplants. And as it turns out, renal transplants are really the gold standard for anybody with end-stage renal disease for any reason. Right? You want to try to get to the point where they can get a renal transplant. And you can end up getting these renal transplants really in one of two ways. They can either be from a donor who is living or a donor who is deceased. And in terms of the living donors, they can be related to you, they can be non-related to you. And, uh, you know, the increase in life expectancy from, liver, from living donors is about 20 years and from deceased donors about 10 years. So ideally you'd get a living donor, but even a deceased donor really gives you um, a significant amount of increased life expectancy uh, for patients with end-stage renal disease. We typically like to place these renal transplants in the right lower quadrant whenever possible. It turns out in the left lower quadrant, you have the sigmoid colon that gets in the way, so it's maybe a little bit easier to place them in the right lower quadrant. And this is what it kind of looks like, at least a schematic of it. You can see the kidney placed uh, over here, and we make three anastomoses. We make an anastomosis between the uh, donor's renal artery over here and the recipient's external iliac artery. We make another anastomosis between the donor's renal vein and the recipient's external iliac vein. We'll make a third anastomosis between the donor's ureter and the recipient's bladder over here. And some of the parameters to at least think about when it comes to measuring some of these uh, velocities is that the peak systolic velocity within the uh, right renal artery of a transplanted kidney will be a little bit higher than in a native kidney. And it's in the range of 200 uh, centimeters per second in general. Also, when we do um, the waveforms within this vessel, we end up seeing a low resistance waveform. So this continuous flow, as you can see here, throughout systole and throughout diastole. And if you were to measure the resistive index, which is defined as the N systolic velocity subtracted by the N diastolic velocity over the N systolic velocity, we end up getting a resistive index of about 0.6 to 0.7, which is what we like for these renal transplants. Now, in terms of complications that we may anticipate post-renal transplants, uh, you know, ultrasound is a great modality, and in fact, almost always the first line imaging modality to evaluate these complications. And when we think about these complications, I really split them up into two broad categories. And the first broad category are non-vascular complications, while the second one, uh, as you can imagine, are vascular complications. So we'll go through these briefly and uh, talk about a little bit what you'd expect to see. First thing I look for for non-vascular complications is hydronephrosis. Okay, now, as it turns out, these transplanted kidneys, for a variety of reasons, may have collecting systems that are a little bit more distended than you'd uh, expect in a normal kidney. But when you really start to see the calyces look a whole lot bigger, for example, tracing over this, really start to get big like this, um, then you can anticipate that there's some degree of hydronephrosis. And you know, understand that that is somewhat of a subjective call. So if you're ever really worried about uh, the presence of hydronephrosis, uh, one quick trick is to measure the resistive index. So get a uh, spectral tracing of a waveform out in the renal parenchyma over here. And if that resistive index is high, it suggests that there's some degree of pressure in this kidney, and that is likely or could be attributed to the hydronephrosis. If we get an RI in that instance of uh, greater than 0 0.8, that may suggest that the hydronephrosis that we're seeing is quite significant. The second complication that uh, I look for is things like uh, renal infarcts. And one of the uh, images that the sonographer should show you when they present their cases is one image where there is color flow throughout the kidney, so the upper pole, the interpolar region, and the lower pole. And with renal infarcts, as you'd expect, you'll see a pretty nice, well-defined region, such as something like this, where there's absolutely no flow. So if you see that, you want to suspect that there's a renal infarct. There's a whole bunch of causes for it, including segmental thrombi of a vessel, dissection of a vessel, but you certainly want to be able to well, look for an image where you don't see any focal flow, and that would suggest that there's an infarct over there. The next thing I look for are the presence of masses in the kidney, and uh, these renal transplant patients are at actually an increased risk for things like RCC, and a whole bunch of other tumors, including something called post-transplant 
lymphoproliferative disorder. And for the most part, as you can imagine, what I'd be looking for on my ultrasound are masses. So I want to see if there's any mass within the kidney, a solid mass or a complex cystic mass. With PTLD, it can look a little bit more infiltrative uh, kind of appearance um, throughout the kidney. So again, it takes only about a few seconds to scan the kidney on grayscale imaging and realize that it's free of masses. Uh, but certainly if you see one, it's something that should be commented on and something that should be biopsied. The third thing I look for is around the kidney. So I look for collections. And for the most part, we can't really tell apart any collection around the kidney. Okay, uh, you can see a collection surrounding the kidney over here and over here. An ultrasound is very good for either detecting the collection and following it over a period of time to see if it's getting bigger or smaller. It's also very good to guide uh, imaging guided biopsy if you want to aspirate it. And some of the uh, collections that we anticipate in these patients include things like uh, hematomas, um, which typically have fluid hematocrit levels. You can also see urinomas at times, which are typically seen near the bladder and ureteral anastomosis. You can get things like uh, lymphocils, um, which are a collection seen about four to eight weeks after surgery. And you can also see, of course, abscesses. So if you see any focus of air within these collections, it's either an abscess or superimposed collection hematoma, urinoma, or lymphocele. One of the other non-vascular complications that is relatively common is this idea of acute tubular necrosis. Or this happens is when you the recipient gets a kidney that is already damaged to begin with. So we end up seeing a little bit more with uh, deceased donors, donors whose kidneys uh, have been damaged for whatever reason. Perhaps they were in a code situation and the kidney uh, did not get appropriate perfusion for a period of time and then was then donated to somebody else. And so it takes a little bit of time for them to perk up. And the imaging finding of acute tubular necrosis is essentially decreased diastolic flow with elevated resistive indices. And we're talking about the realm of 0.8 and above that, and it's typically seen in the first three days of uh, transplant. So if you see that finding in the first three days, it's likely going to be acute tubular necrosis. And in terms of the spectral waveform, if this is what the normal one looks like over here, the spectral tracing for something like acute tubular necrosis will have good systolic flow and no diastolic flow. So if you see uh, the resistive index, which is defined, as the end systolic velocity minus the end diastolic velocity divided by the end systolic velocity, this value will be close to zero. So you essentially get the end systolic velocity divided by itself and a number that'll be anywhere from 0 0.8 to uh, 1.0 itself. And finally, in terms of a non-vascular complication is rejection. And rejection happens in a couple of stages. And from an imaging perspective, the two stages that uh, we can detect are acute rejection and chronic rejection. And acute rejection uh, typically occurs uh, within the first three weeks that the patient has the transplant, while chronic rejection is something that occurs in the first three months. And so one way I like to remember it is that ATN is in the first three days, rejection acutely is in the first three weeks, while chronic is in the first three months. And the imaging findings of a, of a rejection will be somewhat identical to ATN, where you get elevated resistive indices, as well as uh, low diastolic flow. So now let's shift gears a little bit and talk about the vascular complications of renal transplants. And one way to think about it is just to think about the anatomy, right? So we have a a, a renal artery, we have a renal vein, and either of those can get completely obliterated or thrombose or can narrow or get stenosed. So if we first start talking about the renal artery, the first uh, complication we can think about is renal artery thrombosis. And as you can imagine, in renal artery thrombosis, when you evaluate the renal artery, you see absolutely no flow. So when you look at it over here, it'll be completely obliterated. Patients may present with anuria and pain over the kidney, and that really needs to be urgently treated in order to salvage that transplanted kidney. The next complication is renal artery stenosis. Now, renal artery stenosis has a, a bunch of imaging findings that we need to be aware of. And the idea is that for whatever reason, the renal artery gets narrowed. So for example, we see over here, it's not completely obliterated, but it certainly gets narrowed. And what ends up happening is right in that location, the peak systolic velocities get really, really elevated. So they get really high over here, suggesting that this is the area of narrowing. When we evaluate the vessels more distal to it, so in this location, in this location, and especially within the renal parenchyma more distally, what we end up seeing is something called a tardis parvus waveform. So again, if we go back to what our normal waveform looks over here, the tardis parvus waveform will be a little bit different. And that will get peak systolic velocities 
that are lower than what we'd expect, and the time to reach those peak systolic velocities is also quite delayed. So instead of getting a nice sharp systolic upstroke with good flow throughout diastole, you get more of a delayed upstroke with decreased peak systolic velocities. So you can compare that, which is a tardis parvus waveform, with a normal waveform, which should be much like this. All right, so these findings suggest that there's a renal artery stenosis, and this tardis parvus waveform is always seen distal to the region of stenosis. Let's move on to the renal vein. So again, the renal vein can thrombose or stenose. Well, let's talk about renal vein thrombosis. And as you can imagine, with renal vein thrombosis, you'll see no flow in that renal vein. And what's also interesting is what you end up seeing if you evaluate the uh, renal artery in this instance is reverse diastolic flow. So again, if we go back to what our end systolic and end diastolic velocities look like, in renal vein thrombosis, if it's quite severe and complete, you'll end up seeing forward flow in systole and in diastole, you'll end up seeing reverse flow, much like this. So when you see waveforms like that with an obliterated uh, renal vein, it suggests that there is renal vein thrombosis. And again, as with the renal artery, you can get renal vein thrombosis, excuse me, renal vein stenosis. And it turns out there's not much good criteria for this. And you end up seeing a narrowing of the renal vein. And if you use a ratio of about three to one in terms of the elevation and velocities across this narrowing, it is uh, predictive of uh, potential renal vein stenosis. But again, this is an extremely uncommon uh, thing to see. So finally, let's end with two other complications that I lump into the vascular complication, but strictly speaking, they are really seen in the context um, of uh, post-biopsy. And those complications are uh, pseudoaneurysm and arteriovenous fistulas. And the idea of pseudoaneurysm is that, uh, you know, the people biopsy and it's done quite close to the renal hilum where you have a bunch of vessels over there and you end up getting a uh, collection like this that is communicating with the uh, vessels and a portion of it has uh, arterial flow flowing into it and a portion of it has flow going out of it. So what it ends up looking like is something called a yin-yang. So it's the yin-yang sign of a renal artery uh, pseudoaneurysm, and there's a variety of treatments that can be associated with it depending on the sign. So finally, let's end with arteriovenous fistulas, and these are little tiny communications you can see between uh, the renal arteries and veins, again seen typically post-biopsy, and these can be difficult to detect sometimes because of their small size, but you end up really seeing a uh, triad of findings uh, to, that make you suspicious for it. Within the renal artery feeding this fistula, you'll see increased diastolic flow, that's because the renal artery is communicating with the veins, which is a low resistive bed. Within the actual fistula itself, you'll see a lot of aliasing or turbulent flow with very high velocities. And within the renal vein that is draining this fistula, you're going to see pulsatile flow. So if you see these triad of findings in the context of a recent biopsy, it's highly suspicious for a arteriovenous fistula. So there you go. That's a little bit of a summary for renal uh, transplants and their evaluation. At least it gives you a framework for which to uh, approach any potential case that you may end up seeing.